Everybody, uh, welcome uh, to our um, presentation uh, by uh, the famous uh, architect from India, uh, Romy Kosla. Uh, we are so happy uh, to have him with us uh, today. Uh, he is a very busy architect, uh, and he has also his own individual works, uh, as far as I have heard from him. Uh, but uh, he he, uh, he uh, decided he accepted our proposal, and so we are really uh, grateful for this. Uh, I would like to introduce him by reading his CV. Uh, Romy Kosla is uh, known uh, internationally uh, as an architect and consultant on urban revitalization. Having graduated from Cambridge University in economics and the Architectural Association in London, he established his design studios in India some 50 years ago and has designed and built over a hundred buildings, some of which have been awarded with national and international honors. As a revitalization urban planner, he has been a principal consultant to UNDP, UNESCO, WTO, and UNOPS working on conflict resolution missions in the Middle East, Balkans, Kosovo, and Cyprus, and on tourism planning missions to Tibet, China, and Central Asia. He has served as a jury member of the Agahan Awards in Geneva and the city of Izmir. Last year, the Institute of Architects of Antalya awarded him a Lifetime Achievement Award. For, de for decades as an earth walker, he has traveled on foot to research into ancient Buddhist sites in the deeper Himalayas, uh, which he published in a book. And now the CV in Turkish. Romi Kosla, Uluslararası Camiada, kentsel canlandırma konusunda uzman mimar ve danışman olarak tanınmaktadır. Cambridge Üniversitesi ekonomi alanında ve Londra'daki Architectural Association Mimarlık Okulu'ndan mezun olduktan sonra 50 yıl kadar önce Hindistan'da tasarım stüdyolarını kurmuş ve bazıları ulusa, ulusal e, ve uluslararası ödüller almış yüzden fazla bina tasarlamıştır ve bunları inşa etmiştir. Bir kentsel canlandırma planlamacısı olarak e, COSLA, UNDP, UNESCO, WTO ve UNEP, UNOPS'ta Orta Doğu Balkanlar, Kosova ve Kıbrıs'ta çatışma çözüm komisyonlarında çalışan ve Tibet, Çin ve Orta Asya'yı turizm planlama komisyonlarında yer alan bir baş danışman olmuştur. Ahan ödüllerinde Cenevre ve İzmir'de jüri üyelikleri yapmıştır. Geçen yıl Antalya Mimarlar Odası kendisine yaşam boyu, boyu e, ödülünü takdim etmiştir. Onlarca yıl bir dünya gezgini olarak Himalayaların derinliklerindeki eski Budist yerleşim yerlerini araştırmak için yürüyerek seyahat etmiş ve bu seyahatlerini kitap olarak yayınlamıştır. Ee, sözü şu anda kendisine bırakıyorum. Tekrar bir kez daha teşekkür ediyorum. So, uh, Mr. Romy Kosla, the floor is yours. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Welcome uh, all those who are listening. I shall uh, go right into my uh, lecture straight away. Uh, I, I am starting with two principles that condition my work. One is that when water flows down a river, it flows by the natural laws of the world. And when water flows from a vase that you're holding, it flows by your actions from the human world. So we are going to be dealing with the two natural and the human worlds, which are absolutely pivotal in, in my work. Um, now, I need to get to the next slide. So where do I press it? Yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. That's not... That's the arrow. Um, sorry, which is the arrow? Uh, that's right. the arrow, the one that... Yes, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, for me, the, the, the most interesting architecture is the one that balances the human and the natural worlds. It is not necessarily the one that makes impact, visual impact, or uh, 
exposes a style. I'm a few thousand miles from you and our virtual like meditation rather than a talk will hopefully uh, be less than an hour and we still have a way to go. So let us imagine and explore balancing our own actions in the human world and not disturbing the flow of the natural world. I think that's the root of, of urban living, the root of architecture. So I would like to explain to you that for me, the most interesting architecture is this one, which balances. Let's think about harmony. Let's think about what is disharmonious. Knowing. Let's talk about knowing. Let's talk about believing. In other words, I want to make a strong emphasis on your inner selves because it's so connected to the um, architecture uh, of that you are producing. I am going to talk in three parts. So we begin by, and the three parts are basically the present, the past, and the future. And I'm going to give this vast uh, <laughs> landscape to you as briefly as I can. We begin by experiencing the present. And basically, I shall briefly share with you how I personally, as an architect, view the present, how I work uh, the present. In the second part, I shall explain what is it that I personally came to know about our past and how it is very different from the past about which I learned when I was being educated and the past that I learned from my experiences, which is completely different. So it was in an effort to find out why is it that we are living in an era which we cannot live in harmony. That was the nature of the environment. The third part of my talk is about the future journey uh, to resist convention. Convention has locked us in. To live in that, to search for that unsafe space where one can create uh, an entirely new world in harmony with nature. Actually, I'm not sure whether it is easier to live in harmony with nature or to live in harmony with each other. Our era has made us think twice about it. The past has taught me how we have lived in disharmony with both nature and human being. So living in harmony with each other is quite a different topic altogether. So let me start with the ex my experience of the the, the present. Let me see where where is this slide? Oh. Oh. Sorry, I. It's be below the screen actually. Oh, oh okay. Well, thank you. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes. So let's say we are experiencing the present. Um, I'd like to share with you the images of two buildings. I'm going to show you two buildings which were designed and they are my latest buildings. They have been designed together at the same time and built simultaneously in two entirely different uh, locations and environments with entirely different materials, entirely different processes of construction. The first slide uh, um, represents flying house. This is a house in the mountains with a very soft footprint in the landscape. It's made by local craftsmen using local materials, using the stone from the site. <laughs> we call it Flying House because it was kind of inspired by the eagles that fly there. Uh, but basically we trained the local labor to, to make this house. And you'll see it here uh, in its location um, with a minimal footprint in something that is integrated with nature. There's stone, wood, slate for the roofs. Uh, it's a delicate house. It, it, it is fragile almost, uh, sitting with a huge respect for nature. And it is, it is meant for you to listen to the sound of music and to listen to the sound of nature. So it's very open to, uh, when you look at it, it's porous house. It's completely open to the views and the winds 
and you can see the location. This is not very far from where I am speaking to you, by the way. All right. And um, it, it was uh, completely handcrafted. And I'll come back to the nature of craft in architecture because here it is, it's actually a large house. It's uh, 600 square meters and yet it sinks into its place. The stone wall you see on the left hand side is from the local stone and the timber is from, from this area. Uh, in fact, in the gap between the roof and the main house, are all the services are kept there, but you can't see them. This is the quality of the space inside. Um, very porous, very open. Uh, the solidness is within the building and its outer skin is completely transparent. There's another view of how you are actually in communion with me. Um, I move on to the next building, which is the uh, an urban building. It's the corporate headquarters of Volvo Corporation and it's a global company. Unlike the flying house, this house was constructed by 52 subcontractors and global supplies for components. Um, the harmonization with nature is was of a different nature, different kind. Um, it's a green building. So it's self-sufficient in water. It's self-sufficient in all the sewage treatment, etc., that it does and how it uses that, the plant life. The only thing it is not self-sufficient is, is uh, electricity. But it's constructed in steel. It's an entirely steel building. So, um, completely again transparent, but we are down in Delhi where the tropics are hot. So, we had to work out a fairly elaborate uh, system of louvers, which allows the light in so that you minimize the power and you minimize the heat also. Now, the building itself is on this principle of a uh, tetrahedron inside a cube. And there is a typical joint that we designed for the point at which more than two or three members meet. So this was a tricky thing. And we crafted the joint in the studio. First, we made it all so that we could understand what the loading is, how the shell has to be. So cube octahedron is the... Is the um, the hub on which all the nodes are appearing and you will see its function there. You can see right the, the diagonal is leading to the cube octahedron where uh, it's also supporting the structure but inside it are the louvers that were uh, worked out um, with, with, with, with computers and to allow various uh, the, in this hot season when the uh, altitude of the sun is high then we design the louvers in that way. And some views of the interior. Here you can, can see its steeliness. That staircase, for instance, on the left is again very carefully crafted. It is suspended from cables from the roof. It, just, it doesn't have any, it doesn't touch the ground. It touches it in the sense the step touches. There's no load on the ground. Um, and then we, we gave it this uh, a different quality to masonry. Very, very different from the house that we were talking about. And some of the interiors, there's uh, all the furniture inside was made from crates. Volvo imports machinery from Sweden and it comes in crates. So the entire interiors were done by recycling the crates. We did not buy wood from outside. So these are some of the views inside. Uh, no columns inside. It's a column-free structure. Everything was on the perimeter. So we took advantage of the fact that we were using steel to give enormous flexibility. There's a plenum which carries all the services, all the air conditioning, etc. at the end, which is now conventional. But uh, here in India, it's more unusual. I now move from there. I'm going to jump into the past. And this is the second part. And why I'm asking myself, why do we live in times 
so ignorant about nature and the natural world in our era. We have, we have ignored it in our, in our era. Simple answer is that we have become both ignorant and growingly concerned about ourselves and, and being on our own. All the instruments we have and technologies we have are driving us to be alone. For me, the era of ignorance that I call this and the personal accumulation wealth, which characterizes our era at the moment, for me, it began 500 years ago, in 1492, and it has lasted up just over five. During those 500 years, we acquired faster and faster, more and more information in our heads leaving very little space in it for our beliefs and respect for the wisdom about the role of nature in our lives on which we are doing. Now there is making a distinction here between knowing something and being wise about something. And this is something that you in Istanbul can very easily understand because you have a very ancient tradition of respecting wisdom. Now, 1492, Columbus arrives in South America and he slaughters the It is our era of greed. It began with the landing, what is today Venezuela, and then began our era of immense looting of ancient wealth. The Americas were a great source of ancient wealth and the age of genocide and in indigenous populations disappearing. The entire America, South and the North, then went into the age of slavery. And what happened was that they, after, after finishing off the indigenous population, there was nobody left to work to accumulate the wealth, so they imported. Uh, slaves. Our era, and I'm emphasizing this, that we are actually coming to the close of that era. Abusing the natural world and the human species. Now, whatever we do in architecture, etc., has an impact on this indirectly. So we think deeply about it. Just to give you an idea of the scale at which the human indignity was exercised by the Atlanticists, we are talking millions, millions of lives, millions of um, slaves. You look at the map, you will see from West Africa how the slaves had to be carried right across to the Americas to, in fact, gather the wealth. That's all it was. So, I think the Atlanticists at that time lost all sense of humor, justifying their actions and theories. All of this, we then got years of people who were philosophizing about how they could justify this. And you imagine the way that the, the transportations took place. And these are very important to understand that this is the reason, and this is the root of the wealth which has accumulated. This is the carrying. And, and there are, the age of enlightenment comes to us and we have just four examples of how enormous philosophies and justification theories were given to cover up what had been done, to cover up everything, the superiority of the white race, the whole business of what uh, Darwin or Karl. What we ended up with is almost 200 years of conflicting ideologies and justification of enormous violence. Numbers landed in 
Venezuela, Venezuela in 49. I went to Kosovo in 2000. This is Syria, just recently. It was easy for me to see how the rulers of the planet had already had very dark hearts. Their hearts had been very dark for the last 300 years. They don't talk about that darkness and death. Cover it up. I know it because I personally experienced that deeds. These are the, these are the, uh, this is God. I have chosen to show you these reasons. This is the conflicting ideologies. All right. So one ideology was done away with after being attacked. I have chosen to show you these reasons because I have personally been these reasons and seen what is the level of, of uh, violence that is being perpetrated. Look at this scene I am, when I was in Kosovo. The people whose complete house and cities have been wiped out and they been forced to live in tent and I am coming to visit them and look at their level of humanity. They are bringing coffee. Us. The economies have been destroyed. People are selling anything and everything to get by to earn a day's living. And Palestine, I was for nine months in Palestine. Is this, this is the part of the same era that began, began in 49. It's exactly the same. There is no difference. Somehow the compass has got lost. All of you are familiar. And our cities, and I'll be talking on all the cities from now, our cities and our urban development has been determined not by human values anymore. It is not even determined by cost. It's really determined by, by profit. What happens? This is the kind of city we want to develop with this kind of mentality, right? So we are in this. We have already come. Something has gone terribly wrong, and we need to rethink uh, how is it that our children are in this? because there is no way they can live in this world. It has already gone beyond. And here is a scene from the latest developments in China. Here, an artist has has created a, a scene to show how nature is being treated by the city of today. There is another one. What has happened to communication? What has happened to human life? So, we are being packed into urban cities from workers in the accumulation of wealth. And I think that they, they, this is the time to think. We have to this is my image of having to think again. We must rethink. We must enter space which is unsafe and think again, not in a convention. So one of the problem lies, we have to ask ourselves for our future. The big question, can we live a life we want to live or is someone else advising us how to live? And I realize with my journeys and my travels that we are all being advised how to live. So on the left is, I think, what we were. And on the right is, is, a, is a book I then wrote about how lonely one was discovered. How is it that not in the to cast off one had in it and learned, start learning again. First thing that one discovers is that creative space is where reason and believing live together. 
the internal belief, not trying to create passion, internal belief. And one experiences the, the uncertainty, the waves of one, rather than going and creating certainty to certain. Creative work is very uncertain. That has huge value and so I'm just going to take you through uh, some pictures of quest that I was uh, started for another reality. We live in a certain reality. We live in Istanbul. We live in Libya. That's a particular type of reality with certain merited values, with certain education, with certain what you believe is right or not. But that's only just one of the realities. In fact, there are many other realities you discover when you start a journey for certain. So I had gone, here am I, in fact, the tallest person here is living amongst um, the people who had no notion of pollution, no notion of in, in a completely different reality. They are not living in zombie cities anymore. So this was a very important uh, part of the travel to the Tao Mountains, to go to Lhasa, to, to understand that there exists a civilization where people value, who are fragile, uncertain, exist, and there's much to be learned from them. And this was part of that wider experience of realizing that the past that one learned about be completely and that one had to reconstruct one's whole uh, being and discover the relationship our work has selves rather than to create so at the end of this search, we came uh, and proposed this idea of actual cities. In other words, that our present cities are what I would call zombies. They are cities in which you cannot exercise your inner inquiries, your inner searches, your inner needs to create in any significant way. So the first thing we need to do is to change the nap pattern of our urbanization. And I'm absolutely certain that this is going to happen because like we are at the end of our uh, era of violence, dictatorships, autocracies, etc., which, which have to come about because we cannot control <laughs> things anymore. So we are resorting to these sort of things at the last minute. So we have to decentralize it. We have to self-regulate our and we have to become largely self-sufficient without waste. And here are the two uh, contrasts in the systems I'm talking about. We are living in a centralized system and we have to change to a distributed system. And that, uh, you can imagine this as a kind of urban uh, pattern. You can imagine this as a political pattern. You can imagine not I or people do not have enough knowledge to sit in the center and control a country anymore. They are full of ignorance. The stronger they try and make themselves, the more ignorant they are. Because the natural forces are becoming distributed. So we something which I call mesh urbanism, the, the roots of which are already there. Um, People are given much more uh, responsibilities to govern themselves, to feed themselves, to become naturally self-reliant. So there is a different uh, kind of urban pattern, which, I'll, which I want to show you, is the interrelationship between uh, country and its capital city no longer exists. In fact, there are a series of uh, urban settlements, each of which is self-sufficient and natural and is feeds itself and is without pollution, has a completely different uh, relationship as emerging as a new pattern. And 
Okay, and let me give you the example of Turkey. Then here is a night shot of Turkey and the, the Grump map, which is made for uh, settlements of over 50,000. And you see the roots of this is already there. What has happened is that during our era, the, the capital cities have sucked out all the power from the regional area. And now it is impossible because we are out of resource. So my advocacy is for the return to the uh, resource base of the region and to create a series of natural cities, which I'll briefly show you. Natural cities and how they function is a very big subject, but I'm just going to touch on it here. Anyway, I'm going to try and give you some uh, illustrations of the kind of natural cities we are looking at. They can be a whole variety. Here is a typical natural city. These, are, these natural cities have a quality of being perforated in their urbanism. The relationship between nature, agriculture, and the human settlement is completely of a different nature. It is in the order of being balanced. Uh, there's a plan, there's it could be a, it could be like this. So there is a kind of checkerboard pattern of urban development, um, which is natural. And each, uh, each natural city is, uh, is able to feed itself almost 80% from about 100 the population should not exceed a million and you can actually feed yourself from a diameter of about 100 kilometers. The, the entire produce of that uh, is brought to your city. You, the, you reduce the cost enormously. So we have crazy situation today where all the food is taken to a central market in the capital city and redistributed. It, it puts an end to all that sort of stuff. And, um, here is, a, here is a description I'm giving you that it is a chessboard where the squares are built. Uh, the green ones on the chessboard are the agricultural areas and the white is the uh, residential areas, which I will show you subsequently in the slides. 50%, we made some calculations, 50% is built up area. Um, there are, uh, it doesn't go up to very high. And Food production is very, very crucial in this. So here is the checkerboard pattern. You can see uh, this is entirely diagrammatic. As I showed you, city locations and patterns, which I showed you earlier, actually take from this principle. There is a ostensibly a city center, but the perforation between the built form and the green form form a very essential component of the city. Now, if uh, on the left, uh, on the on the right hand side, so you'll see I marked a red box and I'm going to take you close up uh, to this to show you um, what the urban pattern might be looking. Here we are. We've, we've uh, I'll just uh, go back one sec so you can see it again. That's, uh, that's the area that we have on the, on the right hand side. And here we have it where there's a checkerboard urban um, development. And if I go in the red box, in the, bo the bottom of that urban development, I take it a little, zoom in a little bit more and give you an idea of what kind of urban uh, pattern and development and perforation that we are advocating. Um, and the relationship between open space, agriculture and the urban dwelling is completely radically different in natural city. So uh, the low rises, the cycles, much of this is, is known wisdom. So um, lots of people are doing lots of work on this, but we are trying to put it together to see how we can connect it to the production. And here is a, is a shot from Japan, but it gives you some idea about how um, a natural city would have perforated urban forms with agriculture is being a very, very important part of it. Because let's not forget, we've entered an era of uh, enormous use of chemicals in our food products. And natural food is itself becoming very, very difficult to find. So you have to go to special places, and you have to go to places, etc. Natural city is entirely organic, of course. 
and it has found it has and um, yeah here here is this is my final slide to give you an, just uh, an idea of how one such natural city of the future um, will um, will look like from it. now there are many aspects of this for instance uh, one of the parts of uh, one of the aspects of our modern economy the centralized state is that the state or the corporations harvest all the savings from human settlement so one of the very important aspects of the distributive network of natural cities is that much of the surplus is retained by the city and the city provides its own infrastructure which is not dependent on central uh, the main causes of impoverishment the poverty in our improvisation is due to the fact that taxes and and and prices are harvested out in, in the, the small area. so we try to also have a there is a political side to this, a social side to it, and it's a deeply democratic system where each natural city uh, governs itself. So that's the last slide, and I'm I'm very happy. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't kept a tag on the uh, time, but I'm very happy to to open it up to discussions you might have or questions you. Might have. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Romy. Um, uh, now um, I will. Um, I would like to open the floor to our uh, guests who have been listening to you for uh, questions. Uh, but I think um, I will start with uh, the first question. Uh, it's always hard to ask the first question, as you probably uh, have before. Um, uh, I have um, read uh, but one of, in one of your interviews uh, you um, suggested to young uh, to youngsters let's say uh, this is in, in quote uh, in quotations you said invent uh, your own future design your life around it if the design of your life is unique you will become a unique architect <clears throat> now um, of course, this interview was in 2014. Now, uh, after um, seven years uh, with the pandemic and the economic problems and all the wars and all the uncertainties in our lives, um, how would you like to comment on this um, sentence? And how would you like to um, maybe, or would you like to revise this statement? or to make a new um, comment? Well, I wouldn't like to revise it. I'll tell you why. Because we are um, at the end of this era of 500 odd years in a situation where nobody knows what to do. Imagine something like COVID coming at us. We have, we have no idea what impact is going to have, how we're going to settle it, how our countries are going to recover. So you can imagine all of that years of science and technology, etc., led us into a situation where we have depended on so many other people to outline our future for us. And they made a huge mess of it. So we have to enter that unsafe space. We have to invent our own future. We have to spend time thinking about it. Because I can assure you, that everybody who is an architect today is well aware that cities are not working. They are not supposed to be like that. Our built form, our relationship with nature is no longer working. I think that we need to start discussing how we can invent our future, a better future for ourselves. I am suggesting that the basic component of any future that we invent has to be concentrated on the relationship between regaining our natural life and our human habitation. But certainly, I think that the 
careers, the opportunities, the futures that are being projected, that have been projected for us in the last hundred years, uh, the division of subjects into architecture, biology, chemistry, physics, these things are not helping us at all. We have to think environment now. So, yes, please invent your future, but discuss it. Because this is not, this is not navel gazing, it's something you want to go off on your own into a cave and dream about. It is about opening a new discussion, a bold discussion about we want to invent our future again. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, Suzanne, uh, a, prof a professor of architecture in our school, is typing, but maybe, ah, she did. It's not about architecture. It is about the way you are going to live. Is such a touching statement. Actually, architects are designing not buildings, but the way people experience life. Could you emphasize the importance of this for our students? Um, what happens uh, when we train as architects, right? We spend five years being trained as architects. Our training is neglects uh, our own training, the training of our mind. We spend all our time training out the things outside of us, the materiality, creativity, the form, etc. What happens is that when you create a building, I'm as an architect in the conventional sense, create a building, I am not really focusing too much on the process, the internal process that the person living in that building is going through in that building. And it is because we have not internally uh, processed that building within us. We are much more concerned how it looks, how the form is, what uh, impact it's going to have, and have I you know, obeyed the bylaws, etc. All of the aspects that you take in training are to do with outside yourself. Never is there a class in our schools of architecture which says, can we internalize your building? Can we process it to our mind? And that is what is giving architecture a very inhuman quality because we ourselves are not relating to that building. Now, if you take the, the, the flying house, I give it as an example of something that you go to the site, you process it through yourself. And you you are not really worried about how it looks. You do, but it's, it, you don't sacrifice that for what sensations uh, come within you when you process the building inside you, right? So you have to imagine a situation where, let's say, you've got a, a software in your, in, your, in, your, in your computer and you do a 3D of the building and you're rotating it, right, to see its various sides and underside and everything. Now you need to do that inside your mind. Take the building and go inside your mind and rotate it as if you're doing it on a screen. And you'll see a new process opens up inside you. It is definitely uh, architecture about, it's about experiencing your life. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And um, other questions, uh, we also have some Professors who are uh, listening to uh, your lecture, maybe they would like to ask some questions. Well, it was so uh, clear. I mean, it was so um, up to the point. Uh, but I also would like to, um, I was impressed by um, the building that we also use in the poster because you said, you use all the boxes that uh, were uh, used to uh, bring these uh, cars to uh, to the area. Yes. So it was really yes. very interesting because also you are talking about sustainability, self-sufficiency, and minimizing waste, which are actually in the Indian culture. Uh, you know, you you try to 
make use of everything in India. That's what I have uh, noticed. Uh, maybe uh, I thought that uh, you have been using these cultural uh, traditions uh, in uh, in a new way, in a modern way, in this building, for example, by uh, reusing all these all these materials. Yes, in fact, we had not only used the crates, but we had come to an auction house which had the old railway sleepers. In the old days, railways were made with wooden sleepers. And they had a huge stock of them and we bought them for the building. And they were used all over the building. So we recycled. I'm just uh, uh, out of curiosity telling you that railway sleepers are out in the open over which the trains used to run for years. So those, that wood, the quality of that wood is so strong that you can expose it and make a whole building out of it. So we did that and the, the, the platinum rating, the, the, the committee that comes to evaluate the building gives you marks and gives you points. So I was happy that we scored very high on the recycling of wood within the building. Mm -hmm. steel building. And the importance of the steel building to us that we, that I was pointing out to the committee was, look, the steel can all be reused. It's not concrete. So we have, although we have not recycled it from something, this building can be unbolted and all its steel reused for any other building. And that was also a scoring point um, for it. And then, of course, you, the technology you need a lot of technology to help you to make yourself self-sufficient. You know, it's not a wish. It's not that you start living in a different style. But it is that how do you how do your flushes work? How do you recycle that water? How do you keep coming back to it? What water can you educate your plant and, and irrigate your plants with? And that is from the sewage water. But you cannot drink uh, water which is recycled because what happens is that in a housing development, the consumption of water is very high because of kitchens and bathing and toilets, etc. But in a commercial office, water, water usage is much lower to, as a proportion of the people inhabiting that building. So we had certain limitations on that. We could not, for instance, uh, take the purification of water to the level at which it would give us drinking water because that would not let us have any more water for the uh, toilet facility. So we had to play on and off and there's a very good and a very strict marking system that uh, was very useful to us because again we as architects we go to the Green Council they have checklists so it's much easier for us to to uh, you make use of the science and, and make it a, a very very important component of the building. For instance that building is completely computerized. Every motor, every light on it, it comes on the screen in the management thing. So when a light is, when there's nobody in the room for more than a minute, the lights go off automatically. So these are energy conservation steps which we had incorporated into the building using high technology. So we are very clear on this that there is at one level the flying house, which is a basic architecture and with a minimum footprint on the ground. And then there is highly technical buildings that use science to exercise the same principle. For instance, in the flying house, we don't use any science, it's common sense. But the same principles that we use there are then carried to an urban building and use the latest science to give you the same impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, any any questions from our um, audience? If not, uh, I will ask another one. I'm curious about Shamigar. How is it now? I mean, uh, can you give us some um, information about how the city has developed and uh, how the situation is at present in Shamigar? Yes. Um... Chandigarh um, originally came up as an ideal of modern architecture. So yes. Corbusier, Corbusier had uh, spent a lot of time thinking about cities, but he'd never been commissioned to do a city. 
and in much of his sketchbook and works, um, City for Three Million, City uh, uh, Radiant City, etc. But he never built one. And when uh, India asked him to build the city, he immediately came, uh, was very excited, and started work on it. And the first, uh, the first project that he uh, put forward to the um, prime minister had um, hundred-story buildings in it. And <laughs> the prime minister said, "Wait a minute, we don't have this technology." So I'm sorry. He laid the building down on the side and said, that's how you'll make it. <laughs> so Kobusi had to, had to then uh, come to terms with, with uh, a building at a huge, enormous scale. He would not have got a commission like this. You know, this was a scale like Brasilia or something that there was a whole dream project in front of him. But he... Um, made it very successfully but the world is a dynamic place populations keep rising and not everybody he laid down for instance very strict codes as to how the architecture would be controlled and how uh, road widths would be controlled and how access to the roads would be given most of that gradually went by the wayside over the last 10 or 20 years chandigarh has become uh, the capital complex, which is uh, still preserved, the high courts and the um, legislative assemblies, etc., uh, are still the secretariat building, are still in their pristine form. But when you take the city as a whole, it has got occupied. It's got occupied and become humanized. It's no longer a great uh, masterpiece. It's of not movement. sterile anymore. It's not, it's so not sterile. sterile. It has been... <laughs> Humanized. <laughs> Humanized. There are slums and there are all sorts of things that come up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. I've seen photographs of Yeah, I that. think uh, it's interesting because you see the modern movement started off with uh, very much the idea that architects could uh, kind of give human beings machines to live in. And yes. now we that are today, we are today in an area where we realize what we have done to the environment. And we are now wondering how should we react to the environment rather than try and build, uh, you know, ideal cities. So architecture has progressed. I see some more questions coming up here. Yeah, there's another question. The holistic approaches towards creating a sustainable system for cities has not worked as planned in the future. Uh, garden city etc what do you think was the reason behind this how can we make natural cities work um, the most important principle of natural cities is one is its own democratic structure secondly its own resource base now what happens with the garden cities etc were that they were landscape cities there were cities which had a church and it had a meeting hall and housing and a lot of green. But nothing to do with the resources. The most important aspect of natural city is that it grows its own food, organic food. It governs itself. It controls its own pollution. So it, it is in fact a very different uh, creature, not at all related to garden cities because we must get out of... Uh, regarding landscape now we are no longer in an area where we can easily afford to have landscape to look at anymore because we have to have change our relationships between the forest and our human living and the relationship between what we eat and what we produce you cannot sustain a civilization urban civilization where the food is being flown in from all over the world it is completely a disaster and being packed and get fed in supermarkets so the relationship between the your table of eating and your growing has to become much closer so your city should be able to provide you with 80 percent of your needs so there's a difference and it's financial system also is very different 
So when we are talking about a natural city, you might have a perimeter of 100, 200 kilometers around it, by the way, which is part of the city and which is supplying the city with its nourishment and its finances. You will get rich cities, poor cities, craft cities, computer cities, all that will still carry on. There's nothing to do with it. It's not as if you're living in some, you'll have crooks, you'll have burglaries, everything is, that you have in a city will carry on. It's just that the principle of uh, complete decentralization is the only hope that we have after this era ends. This era of, of uh, world autocracies, I mean, how long are we going to give? We can't handle it. It's gone beyond. We have uh, another question. Hale um, Nurchakar, and before it was Idil Akkuzu. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain uh, more about the self-regulating system and the impacts of centralization on architecture? In today's world, always somebody always tells us what to do and how to do it uh, specifically by rules and regulations, etc. So autonomy in architecture looks so hard unless we change the management system. Do you agree with that? I think that we should stop trying to change things outside us. We should change ourselves uh, more. Uh, you see, it, you can't blame them. Why, why are you listening to them? You know, opt out of it. You don't have to do it. So what, what I'd like to uh, just clarify on this thing is that when you say that you have to do something uh, somebody else is telling you to do, it is because we have not got an alternative. Because as I emphasize, reason and belief. Our beliefs are weak. Our reasons may be strong, but our beliefs are weak. We have to strengthen our beliefs in our own inventions, in ourselves. And then we can challenge the management system. So no, we, I'm certain of what I'm doing. I've gone into a different space and I don't want the life that you are offering. I want to live life. Because the most important aspect of what our future life should be, can we create an environment in which we live the life we somebody this is to do with your they will always be there and ruling you thank you and there's there's another question that's coming mm -hmm. uh, maybe Chidam you can yeah, ask the question yourself. Chidam, would you like to ask the question verbally? Just, just a second. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, could you could you please a little bit more uh, explain about your opinion uh, about the main uh, urban differences between existing European cities and Asian cities? Yes. Um, the, the, the main the main difference between European cities and Asian cities is the size uh, of the population in relation to the land the city occupies. There are very few people in cities in Europe compared to people in Asia. Secondly, the range of income, difference of income between the richest and the poorest is much less in the European cities than it is in the poorer cities, in the Asian cities. With the result that a, a large percentage of the population in an Asian city, as you take Thailand, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Iran also, a large percentage of the population is so poor that it cannot afford housing. 
Now, all of these countries have not had the social uh, infrastructure, social services provided to enable everybody to have housing. So one of the characteristics of the Asian cities is large areas of slums. The other characteristic is that there is a very high percentage of people who are self-employed in Asian cities. Whereas in the West, there are much larger percentage of people who are employed by other people. So when we look at the way that the social structure works, um, we also have another characteristic in Asian cities that there is um, acute um, neglect of the countryside and migration. This is something you experience in Turkey also, mm -hmm. that as you go to Eastern Turkey, you'll find the standard of living, the, the, the levels of poverty rise up, and so it leads to migrations. The, the third difference basically is that European cities are much more stable and unchanging, whereas the Asian cities is continuously in turmoil and changing radically every day and are very difficult to govern because the metro size of cities in Asia, including Tokyo and Delhi, Dhaka, are enormous, enormous, unmanageable um, blobs of kind, each, each earning their living, self-employed, trying to get by because the countryside is neglected. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Um, are there any other questions? Well, uh, I think um, we will uh, finish the um, conversation here because there are no more. I, actually, I can ask a lot of questions, but I have to stop myself. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and also for the uh, interesting um, answers that you have given to the questions that we have asked. Thank you very much for being so patient. Uh, and we hope to see you face to face in the near future. Certainly, certainly when this pandemic <laughs> is over, we certainly will, it's a very favorite place okay. of mine, Istanbul. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Romy Kosla. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Thank you, Imra.